All right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Emerging Revolutionary Wars, Red War Revelry. Uh, tonight, we are uh, focusing back up with Boston uh, with Matt here from uh, Red War Spaces. So uh, without further ado, we'll just kick it off by uh, letting him introduce himself and putting his reputation on the line by joining us here at Emerging Revolutionary War. Uh, thanks, Matt, and uh, great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for letting me sell my reputation on your show. That's great. Um, so hi, I'm Matt Wilding. I'm the director of uh, uh, interpretation and education at Revolutionary Spaces. Uh, Revolutionary Spaces is uh, a nonprofit historical organization uh, that is dedicated to um, the preservation uh, and interpretation of the old state house and old south meeting house on Boston's Freedom Trail uh, and exploring um, the uh, ongoing struggle to create and sustain a free society in America. Um, in that capacity, I've had the privilege of developing uh, a number of new programs and uh, exhibits uh, at, the, at the organization, uh, including two brand new exhibits at the Old State House, one on the Boston Tea Party and one on the use of petitions, uh, a new film series uh, on um, the use of the American Revolution's ideology in uh, the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries, uh, and a game, a 40-player game. Uh, for students uh, to uh, negotiate the uh, fallout of the Boston Tea Party in, uh, in 1774. Uh, been with the organization since July of 2020, uh, which is just a few months after the organization was founded uh, as a result of a merger between uh, two of the oldest preservation organizations in North America, which I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit later. So that's me. Well, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh... Mark, uh, I know you're burning with a question here, uh, so we'll pass it over to you to get it started. No, this is great. Thank you uh, for coming on with us uh, this evening. Um, and yeah, uh, so you talked about how you have some, uh, you know, important historic sites that you all take care of. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have to say, I, I, I was up there uh, for the 250th of the Boston Massacre. Um, which I think was just shortly after your organization was started, um, and they put on a fantastic uh, reenactment of the uh, Boston Massacre in front of the old state house there and uh, was able to go see some of the exhibits they had put up uh, uh, for that, uh, you know, important 250th event. Um, and, you know, of course, now we're coming up here in December for another major 250th event. One of the things I found really interesting is just how long a period of time that is uh, uh, going from the Boston Massacre to the Boston Tea Party. You know, in our in our history books, it's kind of like it goes the Boston Massacre, then the Boston Tea Party, then, uh, you know, the Intolerable Acts, and then, you know, you're right into the revolution. But that's a considerable amount of time to go from the Boston Massacre up to the uh, 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 Tea Party. But uh, I guess uh, so, so for the Boston Massacre, I feel like, you know, a, a large uh, focus was on uh, the old state house, since that's right in front of uh, where that took place. So. Uh, I guess that's one of your one of the sites that you all preserve and interpret. Uh, so can you give us a little background on on the uh, on the old state house? What was it and what is it and what, what are you all doing with it right now? Yeah, so um, the, the old state house is one of the two uh, sites that we run. Uh, the other is the old south meeting house. Uh, which is where the Boston Tea Party started. Uh, the old state house is the seat of British power um, from 1713 till uh, 1776. Uh, it's uh, where the British Royal Court is held for a number of years. Uh, it's where the Massachusetts General Assembly uh, meets an elected body of representatives. Uh, it's also where the governor's council and the governor work. Uh, we actually have a replica of the governor's council chamber uh, that is completely intact uh, based on the 1764 records, I believe. Um, and it is where the Declaration of Independence was read for the first time in the city of Boston. Uh, and we actually have a reading of the Declaration on the 4th of July every year uh, from the balcony. Uh, it is also uh, in the shadow of, of Old State House that the Boston Massacre occurred. Uh, and it's in the council chamber that um, then acting governor uh, Thomas Hutchinson uh, took um, took uh, accounts of witnesses uh, and wrote them down and, and wrote his formal um, report of the massacre. Uh, of course, the more popular report, uh, which designated it as a massacre, was written uh, with information assembled across the street at Fannel Hall. Uh, today, we are using it for a variety of, of, of things. Uh, it is our smaller uh, of the two sites. The Old South Meeting House is really great because it's it's just, it's a huge room. In fact, it was the largest room in um, in colonial Boston, uh, but the old state house is much more intimate. 
Uh, and so we have a lot more, uh, more kind of traditional exhibit space in there um, that is kind of interwoven uh, with, in, in most cases, uh, in 18th or in some cases, 19th century kind of style room. Uh, the two big exhibits we have right now uh, are um, a new exhibit in the council chamber on the utilization of petitions by people who didn't have the right to vote. Um, those petitions were actually filed in the room that they're in, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, and uh, it's part of bro a broader theme that we're trying to explore about how people who didn't have the right to vote in the 18th century had their voices heard and how that relates to how people today who feel like their voices aren't being heard um, use different means other than just the ballot. Our newest exhibit in Old State House uh, actually has a lot to do with both buildings, Old State House and Old South Meeting House. Uh, and that is that exhibit is called Impassioned Destruction. And it's about uh, the utilization of property destruction in the Boston Tea Party and in other events throughout American history from the Stamp Act riots of 1765 uh, all the way to the January 6th uh, insurrection. Uh, so it's a really exciting space uh, where we're trying to, you know, kind of bridge the bridge the divide between being kind of a traditional 18th century historic site, uh, but also something that's modern and, and can relate to people in their day to day lives. Yeah, that was uh, one of the things I thought was interesting is when I, when I first heard about your organization starting, could you give us some background on wh where the, the name Revolutionary Spaces uh, comes from? Because it is different than what you would, you know, typically, you know, uh, hear from a Revolutionary War era museum. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think we think of ourselves as not just a Revolutionary War museum anymore, right? We're, 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 two, revolu we're two historic sites, colonial historical sites. Um, but these buildings are instrumental in much of Boston's history, right? They're, uh, they, are they are on the sites of similar buildings um, that occupied their spaces in the 17th century. Um, and they were instrumental in uh, multiple ways uh, in colonial life in the, in the 18th century. Uh, and then, of course, the revolutionary movement itself. But then, like, remember, the old state house was the first capital of the, of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's where the Constitution of Massachusetts, the oldest continuously used constitution on earth, uh, you know, came to life. Uh, it is the first, it is Boston's first city hall uh, and in the 19th century. Uh, Old South Meeting House, uh, likewise, you know, was, a, was obviously a church and was uh, doubled as a meeting house because it was so big. Uh, a public meeting house. Uh, but in the 19th century, uh, after uh, the congregation left the building, um, the building was preserved in the 1870s uh, and then turned into a kind of a space for public speech and public protest. You had, you know, everyone from the, the socialist candidate for president to uh, the, the uh, commemorations of Sacco and Vanzetti uh, in that building. Uh, it's, 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 th these places are instrumental in Boston's life. So to anyway, to answer your question, where'd the name come from? Uh, so I, I can't speak uh, as a witness to that particular conversation because I arrived exactly after it happened. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, there was just a discussion to bring um, these two uh, really important historic sites together uh, in a new and modern framing. Um, so the two orgs that came together um, were the Old South Association, which ran Old South Meeting House, uh, and the Bostonian Society, which ran uh, Old State House. Uh, these are literally two of the oldest preservation orgs in North America. Um, so they have uh, a historic cachet, certainly, uh, but they also, you know, they have a legacy of sometimes being a little stuffy here and there. Uh, and I think Revolutionary Spaces uh, came from a desire from both boards uh, and the staffs uh, to modernize and to speak to the world that we live in now, as opposed to the, the world that the two preservation orgs came out of. Uh, Revolutionary Spaces has kind of a double meeting. Uh, obviously, um, the rev uh, these buildings are revolutionary sites, but there's also an idea that um, these spaces can be used as gathering spaces to, you know, continue the struggle uh, to create and sustain a free society and to keep having these conversations about who speaks for me and how is my voice heard and what can I do if my, my voice is silenced. And hopefully my big goal uh, in the work that I do uh, is to inspire um, visitors and particularly children uh, to see that these spaces in a lot of ways were just, they were just places, right? Uh, Old South in particular, it's just a building. The reason it's so important is because of the things that happened in it. 
Uh, and that can happen anywhere. That can happen in your in your school gymnasium. It can happen in your community community center. Much like the Liberty Tree, it can happen on a block on a street. Uh, and to get to negotiate these physical spaces and see that they're real and tangible and and manageable and not so uh, grandiose. Uh, but they're just normal places, like places that you go to all the time with your parents and your friends. Um, that, to me, makes them really powerful, their, their, their accessibility. And one of the things I think is just amazing, uh, too, is, is, is especially at the old uh, state house, I mean, you really just see, uh, you know, that it's not just a, a relic from the past, but it's actually part of the modern city when you see these massive skyscrapers around it. And as uh, Christopher Jenkins mentioned in our chat, uh, the fact that there's a tea station actually in the basement of the building. Uh, there's actually a tea station under both of our buildings, and it's the same station. Uh, the entrance to State Street comes out of the side of Old South Meeting House and under Old State House. Yeah, it's uh, these are you know these are iconic buildings in Boston, and it, it's funny if you look at how Boston represents itself in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Almost without fail, these two buildings pop up as as visual aids. Uh, to represent the city. And, you know, if you watch a basketball game, you know, right now, or a baseball game right now, or God forbid, a football game, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, they end up, they end up using footage of, of our buildings uh, to represent, hey, you're in Boston, because they're just iconic in association with the city. Uh, uh, there is the plug of not watching football. You haven't been able to say that too often up in uh, New England. It's usually uh, excited for football season, but um uh, we have a few struggling football fans that are part of this uh, this chat tonight. But uh, uh, getting back to the, the good story, um, <laughs> you said uh, you got uh, there and, uh, shortly after the Revolutionary Spaces. So um, what is your background? Were you, uh, are you uh, view yourself as a historian, view yourself more as like a, an interpreter? Uh, what drew you to, to, to the job of this, the Revolutionary Spaces? It's a good question. I'm not sure I consider myself a historian or an interpreter anymore. I, I, I'm trained in, in history. I, I'm a student of, uh, I, I went to I went to my undergrad at, uh, at Suffolk University in Boston. I did uh, my undergrad work uh, in uh, at UMass Boston, though I never defended my thesis because I ended up working in museums before I was done. Uh, so I just uh, worked on the work instead of uh, my thesis. Um, but I, you know, I worked, I, I studied under Robert Allison, who um, I, I imagine most of your audience is familiar with him. But if you're not, uh, Bob Allison is, you know, in my estimation, the premier Boston historian, right? He's, he's Mr. Boston. Uh, and I was really lucky uh, that I just kind of showed up at Suffolk um, just as his star was rising. And, um, you know, he was, he, he took an interest in, in, in me and supported me uh, early on. Uh, I worked at the Freedom Trail Foundation uh, right out of college. Initially, I was a colonial tour guide. Uh, I dressed up as Ebenezer McIntosh and screamed at tourists for years, uh, which I got to tell you was, was a great job. Um, and then ended up on staff. I was the content director for the Freedom Trail Foundation for, I think, five or six years. Uh, and then I moved over to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. Uh, in Dorchester uh, when they opened in 2014, 2015. Uh, that was a really pivotal, pivotal moment in my career um, and really relates pretty directly to how I ended up at, old, at, uh, at Rev Spaces. Um, the Kennedy Institute launched a game, a 100 player Senate game uh, that I was responsible for implementing. Uh, I thought it was a terrible idea. Uh, the game was two and a half hours. It was about the United States Senate. The launch product was on the Compromise of 1850, which is simultaneously uh, a terrible bit, a series of bills and super boring. So just a double whammy for education, right? And the first time I ran it uh, was with Mad Madison Park High School in Boston, uh, which is an underperforming school in Boston. And I saw, you know, I think it was 50 kids walk into this replica of the Senate chamber and immediately respond to adults who are pretending to work for them as Senate staffers because these kids were the Senate uh, and immerse themselves in this historical event and really assess um, the, the complicated history uh, of, of 1849, 1850 and make a much better bill than the, the United States Senate did. Um, so when I, event, I, I worked at a couple other places since then, but I've known Nat Shively, who's our executive, or our CEO for years, and 
he and I talked a, a lot over the years about how cool would it be to to make a game like the ones we did with the Kennedy, but instead of a replica of a historic site, you can do it in the real room. And so when I got a call uh, from Anne Friangle, who is our deputy director uh, in 2020, um, and she she asked me to come on board to kind of navigate the, the reopening of the institution post COVID uh, shutdown. Um, one of my, my big, ad, there were two asks I, I made. One of them was, I wanna make a game in the old South Meeting House uh, about the fallout of the Boston Tea Party. And the other one was, I saw an office it's a closet, little tiny, little tiny closet office on the on the attic floor of the old state house when I was in college. I was visiting the site for a meeting, and I was like, someday I want that one to be my office. And so I was like, I want this office, and I want people to make this game. Uh, and they gave me the opportunity to do both, uh, and it was incredible. And uh, since then, you know, I built the game with my incredible. I have an incredible staff. Uh, I can't speak highly enough about them. Um, and I have uh, incredible colleagues. Uh, but after we made the game, um, we had the opportunity to start making new exhibits. I mean, these buildings have wonderful exhibits, but they pre they predated the new organization. Um, the Boston Massacre exhibit that 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 you saw, uh, Mark, that exhibit was built to be a temporary exhibit. It was supposed to be up for you know a year and a half, two years. Uh, ended up it ended up up for almost three because of the pandemic. Um, so we got to cut our teeth with the, the petitions exhibit, which is small and pretty manageable, uh, and a black box theater series of films that we developed, uh, with RLNG, which you can watch on YouTube. Uh, and then we got to kind of do a, a huge project in this new exhibit on the Boston Tea Party and the legacy of property destruction, uh, which, you know, you never get a chance to do stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, you never get to, you know, re reinvent uh, an entire wing of one of the most uh, recognizable historic sites in America. Uh, so I jumped at the opportunity, and it's 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 been really fantastic. It's awesome. Actually, that segues into a, a question about the old, old state house from somebody on the the chat. Um, is there any truth he said to the rumor uh, that the old state house was slated to be dismantled? But Chicago offered to take it intact, which put, shamed Boston into preserving it. Yeah, um, there's some truth to it. Yeah, um, uh, I was like, oh, is it going to be a ghost question? Uh, but um, yeah, no, there is truth to that. Um, some some of the specifics of it are, are are disputed. Whether or not, like it was the it was the ask that Chicago made that that quote unquote shamed us into doing it. Uh, but there certainly was interest by the the city of Chicago to buy. The building and move it, uh, and um, we opted instead to preserve it. Um, so yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got a question about this uh, this new exhibit uh, you mentioned about the petitions. Um, yeah. What uh, can you just tell us a little more about these? Uh, who's who's petition? Like what time period are they petitioning? And 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 yeah, who who are the types of people who who petition? Because this I I don't know that much about it, but it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, no, it's 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 a thank you. It's a great question. So um, our exhibit on petitions uh, it, it explores um, petitions from four specific lenses um, through the lenses of uh, Black folks that are uh, petitioning for either um, uh, freedom or reparations. Um, all this is all 18th century. Um, we have petitions from white women um, looking for uh, either the rights, uh, the right to you know run businesses, or uh, in one case uh, to essentially gain uh, gain support from the government for being falsely accused of being a witch, uh, and, and the fallout of that. Um, we have uh, some really great petitions uh, filed by indigenous tribes uh, looking for recognition of their land. Uh, and then we have a couple of petitions uh, from kind of the the working man, like laborers who don't own property, uh, to like you know uh, to have like a liquor license so they can open a tavern, uh, things like that. And the idea here was that um, it was kind of kind of double pronged, right? There, first of all, it gives us an opportunity to just highlight the volume of people who weren't represented with the ballot in the 18th century. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's broad, you know, it's, it's the only people who can vote in, in 18th century Boston uh, before and after the revolution uh, are, you know, property owning white men uh, in, in, in good standing in, our, in, a, in a local church. 
um, working class men who don't own property, they can't vote. Uh, women certainly can't vote. Uh, and Black people obviously can't vote. Uh, and Indigenous people can't vote uh, and are struggling to even be recognized uh, for the treaties they have. Um, and so the formal process of petitioning uh, is, you know, in our in our mind, kind of the most respectful way that, that those people could try to have their voices heard. There are so many other ways. Obviously, the, the Tea Party and the Stamp Act riots are, are more violent ones. Uh, but there's also, you know, marching in the street. There's, you know, people stormed through the basement or the first floor of the old state house. Uh, in protest. People uh, burned uh, or hung uh, politicians in effigy uh, to, to make their voices heard and nailed treaties to the Liberty Tree and to and put up broadsides all over town. Um, so we wanted to highlight that there is this tradition of actually following the rules to try to try to try to get what you want. Uh, but notably in a lot of these these uh, efforts to petition, um, they failed, right? Uh, though there are some surprises, uh, there is a petition uh, by one uh, by one woman who uh, who essentially is petitioning for payment for reparations uh, in in the 18th century, and she gets it. Um, there is uh, an uh, one uh, there's a petition from an indigenous tribe who petitions to have their land recognized, and Massachusetts doesn't recognize it, so they go, they go all the way to the top. They go to the king, uh, and the king actually recognizes it. So uh, it's 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 just a great opportunity to highlight that, you know, people have been organizing uh, and have, you know, in, because of their perception, uh, whether true or false, in, in these cases, almost to a, to a person true, uh, that they're being marginalized and they, they don't have the rights that they feel they should, uh, that they still find ways uh, to, to get out there and to, to make a change. Uh, because, you know, I think we all feel that way sometimes, right? The even though we have the ballot, and in, in I think most most of most of your listeners probably have access to the ballot, uh, but e but some some may not. Uh, but even if we do, you know, the the ability to vote doesn't necessarily always translate into feeling heard, right? So what else can we do? Um, and we just wanted to explore that. So as you have um, developed this, you have been on petitions. Was there one as you looked at it that kind of surprise you you didn't know about or like just thought it was kind of for lack of a better term cool yeah. to, to bring out yeah i mean honestly the the one the witch one was really shocking to me <laughs> um the you know the, the so this this woman it was actually a late 17th century uh petition um actually no the petition was early 18th century but the incident was was late 17th uh but this is this was a woman who was persecuted in the salem witch trials um, and, you know, she had a reputation destroyed and lost a lot of money. Uh, and um, she demanded that the government do something about it. Uh, and you never, you never hear that in, in, in the story about the, the, the Salem witch trials. You just hear about the, the horrible deaths. Um, but that there, there is fallout. There's political fallout uh, of that. And um, minor victories. Uh, was really exciting to find. I also just want to call out that um, I worked on that exhibit um, with uh, with uh, Sharon Kong Pering and uh, and Claire Senatore, uh, who were the co curators of that exhibit, who did a fantastic job and did a ton of the work uh, digging uh, digging up those petitions. So hats off to them. Yeah, that's that's great. And uh, you know, a merger of the show where we're going to be up in Boston uh, uh, in two months for the anniversary events. Um, so, uh, could we talk more now about the uh, the the South Meeting House and the uh, uh, so so? Can you give us some background? You said it was the largest yeah. room there um, in in Boston. Um, uh, I guess what role did it play uh, in the in the Boston Tea Party? Yeah, I mean, the, so first of all, the Old South Meeting House is arguably the most significant historical building standing in New England, if not America. Um, it's it's crucial for a variety of reasons. Um, it was uh, uh, it was built um, in I, I, I I'm uh, blanking on the exact year, but I believe it was 1729. Um, in the 1720s, it replaced a, a wooden structure. Um, it's the third church of Boston of uh, of uh, um, uh, for the uh, for the congregation that met there, but the way that uh, the way that these buildings are used 
in the in the uh, 18th century is they're they're not just used for church, and this is true of of, of all these structures, not just not just ours. Um, the church is really the people uh, who attend. Um, so the congregation is movable, right? So this church ended up moving to Back Bay in the 19th century, but the um the other use of the building was it was the largest physical space to meet in boston that was indoors um if you go into fanel hall now if you go into the great hall you'll be like well this build this this does seem bigger and that's what that room is for but that room actually didn't exist uh in the uh in the in the 18th century the fanel hall that we have today is a 19th century construction it was widened it's on the same footprint and parts of it i think are, are still original but it is not the room uh that it was uh our room is the room right <laughs> and um how the way it's related to the the boston tea party uh itself is significant there were meetings that were initially held in fanel hall uh in november of 1773 uh following the arrival of of the, the tea ships in boston harbor uh that were affected by the tax uh, the the tea act uh and the towns some townspeople uh organized to refuse uh the ships from being unloaded uh, and refused to pay the taxes, uh, they got people so excited that too many people started showing to the meetings. So they had to go to a bigger room. And so Old South default by default became the center of that debate through December of 1773 until finally, uh, on the final evening uh, before the tea was legally required to be unloaded, uh, December 16th, 1773, uh, word came to the meeting that reportedly 5,000 people were at uh, that the governor of the colony, Thomas Hutchinson, uh, the great tragic here, uh, villain of, uh, of America, of Boston's history, uh, uh, told them they wouldn't, that he wouldn't send the tea back. And so Samuel Adams allegedly said, uh, there's no more this meeting can do to save our country. And two or 300 men dressed up like indigenous people and, uh, walked out the back door of the building and, and took a left and, through uh 33,000 pounds sterling worth of tea into Boston Harbor. Um that happened in our building. Uh, I would just hi highlight though that that's not the only thing that happened <laughs> uh, in that building. Uh it's not a one trick pony. It's it's where in 1771, 1772 and 1773 and for a few years after uh the the commemorations the orations uh of the Boston massacre took place. Um this is this is an important like civic space in Boston. Um, so yeah, they, I mean, it's it's incredible that the building still stands. It's, it's in a lot of ways kind of an accident that it's still there. It almost burned down in the Great Fire of 1872. Uh, and then there was a essentially a citywide effort to save it, uh, led by uh, predominantly by a group of women, uh, in, including uh, Mary Hemingway. And, you know, now it's, you know, this, this wild national treasure that, that I, that we get to have, uh, and we get to see reenactments of that historic event and other historic events in it. So. Yeah. When we were uh, there for the um, anniversary of the massacre, they did do a recreation of one of those orations. Uh, I believe Joseph Warren uh, spoke at, um, mm -hmm. and it's an incredible space and you're right. It is, it's huge. Um, and, 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 and that's all original, uh, or how much of it is original, do you think? Or? Well, so a lot of it, the floor isn't really original because the floor was actually torn up during the occupation of Boston, uh, by British soldiers and you, the building was used as a writing school, um, in pr presumably to spite us. I mean, certainly also because it's the largest indoor space, Boston's cold, they need a place for their horses, but, uh, also the symbolism certainly wasn't lost on the British. Um, so the floor is not original. The pews are not original. Um, we do have some, some of the balconies are original. Uh, the highest ones uh, are original. Um, but the rest of it is, is reconstructed interior. But it's, the, I mean, the walls are real. Uh, the, the, you're, you're standing in the real space. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's close. <laughs> And, and you're right when they when they talked about that meeting about having 5000 people packed in there I can only imagine. Uh, I think there's a story of like yeah Warren having to be like go through the window or something. Uh, yeah, that story is probably ap apocryphal but it is a great story. Uh, 
And so I encourage repeating it. I just won't go on record as saying I do. Um, catch me uh, without a camera someday inside and I'll tell you all kinds of stories, right? Um, yeah, I mean, 5,000 people, we, we, we've both talked about how this building and this room is big, right? But at the same time, um, I think it was Mark Peterson, uh, the author of a great book called City State of Boston. He teaches at Yale. He said, uh, he said once um, to me, the group, my colleagues, you know, this, 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 this space is intimate. You know, it's not, it's big, it's a big room by colonial standards, but it, you know, it's not the, it's not the Capitol building in DC, you know, it's not the, it's not where parliament meets in England. It's a, it's a church. It looks like a lot of other churches in Massachusetts. Uh, it looks and feels very familiar. And to imagine 5,000 people in that space. I mean, our, our, I believe our fire limit is 500. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 5,000 is a lot for two reasons. One, physically getting 5,000 people in that room feels hard. Uh, but two, we got to remember that in 1773, we're talking about a population of, you know, 15, 16,000 people. So if 5,000 people show up, that's a, that's a third of the population uh, on one place. Can you imagine a third of, of the population agreeing on or caring enough about anything to <laughs> show up? I mean, that's, that's wild. Um, you know, for modern standards, we're talking in Boston, we're talking 200,000 200, people showing up to the same place. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> the numbers. I mean, yeah, when you put numbers 5,000 out of like 16,000 Boston residents mm -hmm. or so forth, I mean, that's, it's literally the hottest commodity in town. Um, at that, uh, now, it's like a Taylor uh, Swift. That you want to talk, you want, <laughs> You won't try to get 5,000 people in there on, uh, in December of 2023. Um, did you get a... We will, not, <laughs> we will not have 5,000 people inside the building in, in 2023. We will, have, we will jam in as many as we're legally allowed to, and there will be festivities outside. Um, I would really encourage people to come out this year, the, because as, as you, you folks know, but if your listeners don't, there is an event that's indoors, um, the, the reenactment of the, uh, the, uh, the, the meeting of the body of the people. And then they go out, the, they go out the back door and then there's this big procession and we go down to the harbor and we, we go to the, the Boston Tea Party, party ships uh, and they do the destruction part of the show um, on, on their ships and you, and you can view it from the street. So um, if you've never gone, it's, it's fantastic. It's really festive. There's, uh, there's often like, you know, drummers and, and soldiers along the street who are, you know, causing, causing trouble. And it just, it's, it's a really, um, it's a really great civic experience, you know, because it's obviously a, sh a show, you know, it's not like you're ever under any illusions about the fact that you're really at the Boston Tea Party, but you're, you know, you're stepping in the, in the same, same footsteps as, you know, some of the most important historical uh, contributors to the, the founding of the Republic that, that Massachusetts has to offer. So it's really exciting. Um, at the same time, you know, we get to explore, you know, the, the, the differences in the waterfront and the, and, and the, and the area around Old South. Uh, the Tea Party happened a lot closer to the Old South Meeting House than it does now, uh, because uh, we landfilled a lot of the area, which is now the financial district. Uh, and so we actually have to walk a lot farther <laughs> to get to our event uh, than the folks uh, who contributed in 1773. But, so it's on about uh, December. So the event's kind of already uh, sort of planned or so forth. But what is, is there something unique um, that you're very excited about that's a, a wrinkle for the 250th? Yeah, so, um, well, so really the the most unique thing is that the show's back, right? Um, since the pandemic, we haven't had the full-on show um, that we had pre-pandemic. Last year, we did a reenactment, uh, but we didn't get to go to the ships. The ships uh, were, not, were not prepared at that point to do it. Um, the, uh, the year before that, we, we ran, or uh, we ran kind of a goofy, um, goofy comedy show called Tea Party Tonight, uh, where we did like a late night talk show because we couldn't have people in the building because <laughs> of, of the pandemic. Um, so really the, the biggest thing about 20, about the 250th anniversary is that we get to do the show with all the bells and whistles again. Uh, we've certainly punched up the script. Uh, we've, uh, we've made sure that there's a, a broader narrative. Uh, we've made the interactive part, um, with, uh, with the audience, 
a little bit. Uh, we we did a, a test run of it last last year. Uh, I think it works better now. Like we it used to, it used to go a little off the rails sometimes when uh, when we because we just would let folks take a microphone and say whatever they wanted to say, and they weren't they weren't ever saying like oh, throw over the government no, and I mean this president. They were never doing anything like that. Uh, it was just you know they'd go on tangents. Um, as as audiences often do. Now we actually have scripts for the audience to portray different historical figures who had opinions, had very clear opinions uh, of of the issue at hand, and that really I think enlivened the event and turned it into something where people can feel like they're they're really part of the show as opposed to something where they're they're responding to the show. Um, and yeah, it's gonna it's just gonna be. Big. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of people uh, in the streets this year. It's, I mean, there's, there's, we've been getting requests for over a year uh, about this show. And I know thousands of people will be in town for this. Uh, it's gonna be a hot ticket. And it's, tickets are available. Um, I don't know that they've actually gone on sale yet, but there's a list uh, online uh, on redrevolutionaryspaces.org. Uh, where you can get access to them and you will get early access if you are a member of Revolutionary Spaces. So folks, become a member. There's the plug. And uh, I know if you need somebody to dress up uh, uh, for one of the historical characters, there's somebody potentially on this Zoom right now that has done reenacting. And would be I was told eager. really specifically by Robert not to let Mark do that. <laughs> Um, which, which well, is, I was hoping oh, you didn't see that line in the email. So yeah, you missed that line. The, but, but we can, we can talk about it for sure. The other thing that's happening, it's not happening the night of the tea party, but it's the, the month leading up to it. So start opening on November 1st. Uh, we actually have a new play called Phyllis in Boston, uh, which is about Phyllis Wheatley, uh, and the arrival of her book, uh, her poem, her book of poems. Phyllis Wheatley, Wheatley is the first, uh, published, uh, black woman poet, uh, in America. Uh, and her book actually, just by a crazy series of coincidences, the first edition of her book was on the Dartmouth, which is the ship that carried the tea over. Uh, and so we have this, this great new theatrical program uh, opening on November 1st. Tickets are available at revolutionaryspaces.org for that. And it's going to be running for the entire month of November into early December, um, where you can really get a different and new context to, uh, to the crisis. Because you know, th th this is one of the uh, Mark. I think earlier you mentioned the 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 amount of time that passes between like the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. the The amount of time that passes between the Stamp Act riot of 1765 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776 is about the same for context. I say this to, to visitors a lot. Contextually, it's about the same amount of time as when Massachusetts passed gay marriage to when the rest of the country got it. And like we all lived through that, right? That was that was a long time. <laughs> like uh, and likewise in in Boston, uh, this is a long time that these people are struggling with it. But not only is it a long time, but there's people are concerned with stuff that's not uh, that's not a tax, right? <laughs> or not uh, whether or not their business can be run. Uh, people like Phyllis Wheatley are, are worried about the first edition of their book. This is a big day for her, right? And and it's disrupted by by this protest. Um, and, you know, it, the, the coercive acts uh, have political consequences, right? But there's also life consequences. It, it disrupts your business. It disrupts your life. It shuts down your port. Um, and the real life consequences of day-to-day uh, -day life uh, that these historic events create are, are not things we often explore. So I think we're, we're, we're having some fun getting into the weeds there. Uh, well, I just want to say, so you talked about the, the buildup, you know, to the Boston Tea Party. And I think you also mentioned, you know, how the South Meeting House is also plays a role in the aftermath, uh, do you guys have plan things planned for next year going into, you know, any, any, any sort of events or programs or exhibits that you're going to be focusing on that? Yeah, so um, broadly, there's going to be an arc of, of uh, programming on representation um, throughout 17, uh, the, the 2024 season uh, as kind of a, a bridge to get into, um, into, uh, into the 2025, 2026 revolutionary um, event, right? Um, I don't have anything formal to announce. What I, what I can say is that uh, there is programming in the pipeline. 
Uh, and um, we also have you know more new, more new exhibits and more programming in the in the pipeline in line for 24 and 25 uh, that is going to particularly reinvent the way that old South Meeting House looks. Um, we've really done most of our exhibit work uh, so far at Old State House for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that really the stuff at Old State House was just older, so it just, just needed to be updated more. Uh, but also, you know, in the gallery space kind of lended itself well uh, to being revamped. Uh, Old South Meeting House doesn't have a ton of gallery space. Um, it's, you know, it's a fun, it, it's used for public events, right? Uh, we have cases in the back that we're going to be revamping, hopefully for the end of 2024. And then we have, we have a big plan for 2025. Uh, and I don't want to spoil anything because there's going to be a rollout, but we're, we're, gonna, we're reimagining the way that building is used uh, from a visitor experience point of view that I think is really going to blow some minds. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. So there's the teaser there, right there to uh, stay tuned. Sign up to our newsletter and, <laughs> and you'll find and out. Become a member, right? To yeah, become a member, a member yeah. and you'll learn. Uh, yeah, um, and, and you know, I, I don't, I don't mean to be coy, but also like you know, for, you know, obviously we need. We, it's not done yet, so I don't want to announce it. But uh, this, the, the old South Meeting House has the potential to be a focal point um, for historic interpretation, just because of its size and scope. Uh, and so just spending the time to, to figure out how to tell that story in a bigger way. And I think we learned a lot from the game from Revolution is Brewing uh, about how we can utilize the physical space to do bigger interpretation. Uh, and now it's about translating that from a school program to a general visitor program. And I, I'm excited about it. <laughs> and, uh, someone is just, just asking if there was a Tea Party game. There is. So, well, uh, it's an aftermath of the Tea Party game. Um, you want to throw sh uh, ship uh, stuff off a ship. Uh, you know, obviously, the Boston Tea Party Ships Museum has that experience. Um, but if you want to, if you want to deal with the nitty gritty aftermath, yeah, Revolution is Brewing uh, is a game that we developed for eighth through twelfth graders uh, to um, to deal with uh, the emotional and personal and political fallout of, uh, of the Boston Tea Party mm -hmm. uh, in 1774 from the perspectives of loyalists, uh, radicals, uh, people who are kind of middle of the road, uh, and people back in Britain. Uh, and it's it's gotten a great response. It would actually won Civics Game of the Year at Games for Change last year, uh, which was a big honor for us. Uh, and we're also developing two new programs for uh, third through fifth graders right now. Uh, that we're really excited about. One is a revamping of the classic Tea is Brewing program, which is literally a, a classroom reenactment of the Boston Tea Party um, that my co colleague Karina, Karina Olin is really building some agency into. And then we have a, a program that we're developing right now that's in very early stages with uh, our teacher advisory committee. Uh, but Revolution is Brewing, we've also done for the public before, and I, I hope to do it again uh, once, the, once the reenactment's over, because it's it's fun to get a bunch of adults in that room and give them historical role play uh, 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 perspectives and a couple of beers. Uh, you get you get uh, you get some really thoughtful and fun um, play out of that. So hopefully we'll get to do it again. Before we move on, uh, we our good friend John Bell, as you probably know uh, yeah. as well, said that he's hopeful that there's return the horses to the new revamping of the old state meeting house. Um, whatever you're brewing for 2025 includes horses. <laughs> Look, John, uh, <laughs> come on, man. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'll talk to John offline about that. Uh, if he if he can come up with a feasible way to to do it without ruining our floors, I, I'd, I'd be open to it. But I suspect uh, we, there's going to be a couple of, of obstacles <laughs> to, to bring in the not original flooring anyway it's not original flooring anyway so it's true and it does need to be it does need to be replaced so maybe we, this will like expedite that process as we can have the horses tear it up again and uh we can do it a kind of a fundraiser around it it'd be be oh. a good time shout out to john uh, to john bell to jl bell who um has been running the blog boston 1775 since i was in college uh i very much have leaned on him for interpretation so it's it's nice to hear that he's uh, he's listening in Sure. Yeah, I don't know how he has the time for it, but uh, yeah, he doesn't um, sleep. 
no sleep. He was also John. It should be mentioned. John is not not only uh, a listener. He's also part of the show. Uh, John was our narrator for um, the Boston Tea Party reenactment last year, and he did a fantastic job. So thanks for that. Uh, so um, with that, uh, as we wind down here and so forth, um, is there any? I mean, I know you've pushed for 2025 is there uh if someone shows up um to boston right now they want to get a uh a feel of the city since you were a tour guide prior to doing this uh mm -hmm. what's some of the sites that um that you would give to a first time boston bostonian visitor outside of like the norm the big ones that well i mean uh, after, after, after they stop at old state house and old south meeting house which are obviously the top tier that you absolutely have to have to see uh with groundbreaking new exhibits just doing incredible work those people um and you know we do have a tour actually available that i i i will just give a plug to uh called massacre and memory um which is um a, 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 my attempt to kind of revamp the walking tour of downtown uh to give it a specific historic lens and talk about uh not only the boston massacre and how it's remembered but also how things are preserved uh and and what what choices go into what is and is not preserved uh, i think that's a, a really great uh way to see boston uh if you're looking for other historic sites though other than ours and and god i gotta tell you again go to ours gosh um look uh, the 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 african meeting house is uh, in my in in my estimation the most overlooked and underrated historic site in massachusetts uh they're doing fantastic work over there and they're just down the street uh when you're over there too you can you can hop into the west end museum which i believe is reopening uh relatively soon uh if they haven't already um but they they they've been doing fantastic work over there for a long time um Go on to the USS Cass and Young over in the Charlestown Navy Yard if you can do it. Um, you know, the USS Constitution is an incredible ship, um, and the, the USS Constitution Museum is fantastic as well. The Cass and Young, though, um, is another kind of overlooked part of Boston's history. Um, the, the Charlestown Navy Yard was uh, where the Fletcher class destroyer which the, the Cass and Young is one of them, uh, was built in the largest numbers in America during World War II. Uh, the, the Cass and Young was actually not built in, um, in that Navy Yard, but that type of ship was. Um, th that, that ship is incredible. It's got an incredible story, but the story of Boston's contribution uh, to World War II is so overlooked because of um, the, the centrality of, of particularly the West Coast production of ships. Uh, so the opportunity to, to see Boston's role in World War II through that ship, I think, is 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 something you can't pass up. The JFK Library has a fantastic new exhibit on World War II uh, and, uh, and, and JFK that is absolutely worth seeing. Um, obviously, the Freedom Trail sites are all fantastic. You should you should see every single one of them. Um, but yeah, those are those are the big ones for me. Um, you can't you, it, the African meeting house is is so overlooked and it's it's really it's a very good museum yeah I'm talking about uh oh, I'm sorry good more. I was just going to jump on and just also you know I, you know also say that that the freedom trail is is a pretty unique thing um that you can actually walk the you know two mile two two and a half miles and see you can spend all day looking at different historic sites and and of course there's bars and other things along the way as well so it's a the really best part of the freedom trail is the bars exactly. <laughs> the least historic but the most interesting right uh yeah you know the freedom trail is a fantastic tool um you know i i as i mentioned i worked there for i worked at the foundation uh for a long time uh i do uh, you know, and I would never say don't go on the Freedom Trail. Obviously, you should go on the Freedom Trail. The one thing I, I would say, and, and I, I would love for us to have a broader conversation as a field about, is that the Freedom Trail came out of an initiative in the late 50s, early 60s, um, to essentially as a as a wayfinding finding tool, right? It was to help tourists not get lost because Boston is designed in a very confusing way. Um, somehow, uh, over the years, it has come to it has come to be believed to be by visitors like the route that Paul Revere rode, or like the specific narrative of an ar the arc of revolutionary history. Despite the fact that a number of the sites have nothing to do with the revolution, um, and so while you know the Freedom Trail is is a a fantastic tool 
uh, and everyone should use it while they're in town. Uh, the one thing that I would advise people to do is to not lose sight of the fact that the red bricks are not the only path, right? There's there's so much to explore in Boston. There's so much to see, uh, not just in downtown, but in Beacon Hill and Back Bay and, and Roxbury and all the neighborhoods. I live in Hyde Park in Boston, uh, which has, you know, historic sites in, uh, associated with the 54th Regiment, which is the first uh, uh, Black regiment in, in the American Civil War, um, you know, the, this place, Boston's amazing. There's amazing stuff. So whatever your whatever subject you're interested in, whether it's uh, you know Black history or queer history or women's history or revolutionary history or Civil War history or World War One history or World War Two history or you know whatever thing it is, uh, I promise you, there's something kind of amazing here uh, because Boston's been the center of been been a major center of uh, American thinking and American life for a really long time. They, they called us the Athens of uh, Athens of America for a reason. You know, this place was important, uh, um, and it still is. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, cool question for you uh, from the uh, group. Actually, I think it's a good one. Uh, any tips if someone comes to visit historical sites and is seeking like an adult only experience, avoiding school trip groups? Or having opportunities to engage with interpreters at a more advanced level. Is, do you, the revolutionary yeah. spaces offer programs like that, or do you know? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So, I mean, it varies from place to place. Obviously, um, the one thing I would say is go go later in the afternoon. Um, school school groups don't come after two in the afternoon. Uh, so, in and you know, traffic in general is usually a little bit lower in the sites at those at those hours. Um, so, come in the afternoon, and then. Um, you know, the funny thing about engaging with interpreters is that if you find an interpreter who's not doing something, they'll talk to you all day because uh, they love, like in my experience, people love talking about this stuff. So really it's just a question of not coming during the busy season. So yeah, come in February at two in the afternoon and the interpreters will spend all day with you because uh, they haven't seen a person <laughs> all day. Um, but past that, uh, you know, I mean, the each site is unique in its its programming. I, I, one of the great things and struggles uh, of Boston is that we aren't one unified thing, right? There's a national park, uh, there's revolutionary spaces, there's the Paul Revere House, there's the uh, USS Constitution Museum, which is separate from the USS Constitution. We're all separate entities, uh, and so our programming schedules differ. Um, so, you know, look, check, check in uh, on the site's websites that you want to see and see what programming they have to offer. But uh, worst case scenario, you know, just come, uh, come late in the afternoon in the off season and just engage directly with folks. Uh, I, I can't think of a single interpreter on any site that I've ever been to that would be like, you know, I just don't want to talk to you anymore. Let's, I can't, I can't imagine it. Uh, I had to be told to stop talking to a group of adults uh, on Friday, because we had to close the museum, and I just lost track of time. So, and we we got another uh, uh, question too from uh, Matthew about uh, you know obviously you know nothing's going to beat you know visiting and being in that space or whatever. But for people who are unable to visit, uh, is anything going to be available online, or are there any other resources that Revolutionary Spaces has digitally? You know, you mentioned a newsletter or something like that for members. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so we have a newsletter um, uh, which you can register for at revolutionaryspaces.org. Uh, we also the the vast majority of our public programs are on our YouTube page, um, it, as well as those films that I that I mentioned that are showing in our exhibits right now. They're also available online. They're called uh, um, I believe they're called unfinished unfinished business. Uh, those are there. Um, the Tea Party Night shows that, that we made are there. Um, forums with all kinds of great speakers and thinkers uh, are all online. Uh, we do have the Reflecting Addicts exhibit is on our website um, because it's no longer up. Um, we are talking about trying to figure out how to do an impassion destruction online exhibit. We haven't we haven't gotten around to it yet because we're we've been a little busy. Um, and yeah, our programs stream off, often live, um, but if not live, almost always are online. Uh, after the fact it, uh, at um, our YouTube page. So check out Revolutionary Spaces on YouTube and hit that subscribe button. Uh, follow us on social media. Uh, I I, in my opinion, we're strongest uh, on Twitter and Instagram. 
Um, so check those out. But yeah, we have we have a ton of resources online. I also, you know, that's I, something just occurred to me. One of the other things that we have online that is really pretty incredible is um, our collection, our associate director of collections, uh, 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 Lori, um, uh, her name was Erickson until last week. I believe it's Fiddler now. Um, but she did a really great job um, dealing with our collection and and getting our our digital assets back online. So on revolutionaryspaces.org, click on collections. We have a really searchable database of collections with fantastic resources from the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so check that out. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm definitely going to check that out. And yeah, and our, or our group, Merging Revolutionary War, will be up there for the anniversary too. And we'll probably be doing some, some videos from different places and hopefully get to meet you in person uh, while we're up there. Uh, yeah. it's, it's hang out. I'll bring you into all the, all the restricted spaces. I, I love to bring folks up to the, uh, the tower of old South meeting house, see, see how high people will go before they start freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, any, uh, before we wrap up here, man, any last comments, thoughts, plugs that you would like to do? Yeah, um, uh, so I would just say that first of all, I say thank you. Thanks for having us and 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 for doing this work, uh, getting the word about, out about what we're doing in the historical community is really important. Uh, the anniversary work is really important, and obviously is going to take center stage for a while. But you know, these are these are big stories um, with with lots of stuff to explore, um, and we we're lucky to live in a city that has has such a deep. Um, body of, of history to explore. So I would encourage folks to come come check out what we're doing uh, and then, you know, keep on digging because, uh, the, you know, there's there's endless stuff to find in Boston. Uh, I would also just say, um, I, I, I want to plug it one more time, uh, Phyllis in Boston opens on November 1st. It's going to be a fantastic show. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, and then, of course, um, get your tickets for the reenactment as soon as possible because I promise you it's going to sell out. There you go. Uh, get there early, stay late, and enjoy uh, Revolutionary Boston. Yeah. Um, so, with that, uh, I'd like to, uh, of course, thank Mark and, and, and especially Matt for uh, taking the hour to, to chat about Revolutionary Spaces, 250th of Boston. Um, just to let our audience know, we'll be returning in two weeks, uh, changing gears slightly, uh, actually building up to it, I guess, uh, for returning to a talk with historian Glenn Williams. Uh, former um, military historian for the U.S. Army War College, et cetera, uh, talking about for Britannia's glory and wealth um, from the French Union War, all the events that kind of led up to the American Revolution. So giving even more background. Uh, that'll be two weeks on October 29th. So um, while you're getting ready for Halloween, join in and uh, listen to a little bit of history uh, for an hour. So thank you, everyone, for your questions, for your comments. Uh, once again, thank you, Matt. Uh, stay warm in Boston. Um, and we'll see you uh, in December, if not earlier. So yeah, we'll, uh, have we'll try to stay everyone. warm then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there might be a little more drinking there. Um, Again, but, uh, no comment on, on camera on that from me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have a good weekend, uh, rest of the weekend.